continuation and actually conclusion of the uh, weekend seminar on Sri Nectar of Instructions. So we've been going through the text and we're at the uh, final three verses. And then we're going to do three verses and one in this one session. This is verse number nine, number 10, and number 11. As we mentioned earlier, uh, this particular text deals with the whole process of bhakti. Stradha, sadhu, sangha, bhajana, kriya, anartha, nivritti, nishta, ruchi, ashakti, bhava, and prema. And say, close the window. So, these two, these last three verses are on the highest spiritual understanding available. <laughs> so it may seem a little bit esoteric, but we'll make it try to make it understandable for everyone. Uh, those of you who are just coming in for the first time for a lecture might be like all of a sudden you're in the middle of something that <laughs> is not comprehensible. But we've been studying this one text written by Srila Rupa Goswami called The Nectar of Instructions. This is the size of the book. It's one of the most uh, practical, fundamental, and at the same time very uh, deep philosophical teachings on the process of bhakti yoga. And um, we've studied the first eight verses 9, 10, and 11 deal with the uh, prema bhakti, or love of God. And it, it speaks about the glories of Radha Kund. So Radha Kund is the highest spiritual principle. And we'll read that in this, nice, in this ninth verse here. So the verse is on the board. We're going to try and chant it. I'll chant it, and then you all chant it together after I chant it. Is that okay? That means you all have to be one voice. <laughs> Give it a try. Vai kunta janito varamoda. I'm sorry. Vai kunta janita varamoda pura tatapi rosa sadvad. Marapura tatapi rada sodha Vrindava yama udapani ramanata trapi govardhana Radha kunda ihapi goloka pati premamritat palavanat Kuryam asad virajito gira tate shiyam vik vivike nakaha Okay, ma om Vishnu padaya Krishna prastaya bhutale shi makti bhakti viranta swami iti namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Godavani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Pastyatya De Satarne Om Agyan Timirandasya Gerajana Salakaya Chaksu Un Balitam Yenatas My Sri Gurudevena Maha Sri Chaitanya Minobistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Shri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sivasadi Gauda Bhaktavinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare Hare. Okay. Word for word, Vaikuntat. Dan Vaikuntha. The spiritual world. Janita, because of birth, Vara, 
debtor, Madhupuri, the transcendental city known as Mathura, Tatra Api, superior to that, Rasa Utsavat, because of the performance of the Rasa Lila, Vrinda Aranyam, the forest of Vrindavan, Udra Pani, of Lord Shri Krishna, Ramanath, because of various kinds of loving pastimes, Tatra Api, superior to that, Govardhana, Govardhan Hill, Radhakundam, the place called Radhakund, Iha Api, superior to this, Goloka Pate, of Krishna, the master of Gokul, Prema Amrita, with the nectar of divine love, Apa Apla Vanat, because of being over flooded, Kuryat would do, Asya, of this, Radhakunda, Virajitaha, situated, Giritate, at the foot of Govardhan Hill, Sevam, service, Viveki, who is intelligent, Na, not, Ka, who. Hmm. So, Srila Prabhupada's translation of Rupa Goswami's text. The holy place known as Madhura is spiritual, su spiritually superior to Vaikuntha, the transcendental world, because Lord Krishna appeared there. Superior to Mathura Puri is the transcendental forest of Vrindavan because of Krishna's Rasalila pastimes. And superior to the forest of Vrindavan is Govardhan Hill, for it was raised by the divine hand of Sri Krishna and was the site of his various loving pastimes. And above all, the super-excellent Sri Radha Kun stands supreme, for it is over-flooded with the ambrosial nectarian prema of the Lord of Gokul, Sri Krishna. Where, then, is that intelligent person who is unwilling to serve this divine Radha Kund, which is situated at the foot of Govardhan Hill? Mm -hmm. Okay. Purport by Prabhupada. The spiritual world is three-fourths of the total creation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and is the most exalted region. The spiritual world is naturally superior to the material world. However, Madhura and the adjoining areas, although appearing in the material world, are considered superior to the spiritual world because the Supreme Personality of Godhead appeared in Madhura. The interior forests of Vrindavan are considered superior to Mathura because of the presence of the twelve forests, Dwadasavan, such as Talavan, Maruvan, Bahulaban, which are famous for the various pastimes of the Lord. Thus, the interior of Vrindavan forest is considered superior to Mathura. But superior to these forests is the divine Govardhan Hill because Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill like an umbrella raising it with his lotus-like beautiful hand to protect his associates, the denizens of Braj, from the torrential rains sent by the angry king Indra, king of the demigods. It is also at Govardhan Hill that Krishna tends the cows with his cowherd friends, and there also he has rendezvoused with his most beloved Sri Radha and engages in loving pastimes with her. Radha Kund at the foot of Govardhan is superior to all because it is there that love of Krishna overflows. Advanced devotees prefer to reside at Radha Kund because this place is the site of many memories of the eternal loving pastimes between Radha and Krishna, Krishna and Radharani. 
Rati Vilas. In Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhilila, it is stated that when Lord Sri Krishna, Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, first visited the area of Rajabhumi, he could not at all find, first find the location of Radhakund. This means that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was actually searching for the exact location of Radhakund. Finally, he found the holy spot, and there was a small pond there. He took his bath in that small pond and told his devotee that the actual Radhakund was situated there. Later, that pond was excavated by Lord Chaitanya's devotees, headed first by the six Goswamis, such as Rupa and Raghunath Das. Presently, there is a large lake known as Radhakund there. Srila Rupa Goswami has given much stress to Radhakund because of Lord Chaitanya's desire to find it. Who then would give up Radhakund and try to reside elsewhere? No person within transcendental intelligence would do so. The importance of Radhakund, however, cannot be realized by other Vaishnav Sampradayas, nor can persons uninterested in devotional service of Lord Chaitanya understand the spiritual importance of the divine na nature of Radhakund. Thus, Radhakund is mainly worshipped by the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, the followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So in this particular, we're still hearing about the various stages or the various levels of spiritual potency. Even in the material world, we understand that there's three modes of material nature. There is the lowest mode, the low of ignorance. Higher that is the low mode of passion. And higher that is the mode of goodness. So all activities take place within these three modes. And people are on various levels of what we say material practices according to the their desires and their connections with this particular mode. The lowest mode is the mode of degradation. Higher than that is the mode of hard work for material uh, happiness, success. And higher that is uh, the, pious, the nature of pious activities and higher spiritual, not higher, higher material principles such as knowledge, poetry, art, that we call the finer things in life, the mode of goodness. So in the material world you find different gradations of living beings and different types of lifestyles. So similarly in the spiritual world we also find these gradations. But what makes the gradations there is that everything is spiritual, but everything is, is intensified by a particular activity that the Lord performed in that place and that gives the different categories of these spiritual realms. It's interesting to note there that the spiritual world, Vaikuntha, the place where Lord Narayan in his forearm form resides, is inferior to Mathura, which appears in this world as the place of Krishna's appearance. Because Krishna is the source of Narayan, and therefore, wherever Krishna appears, that place has more power, more spiritual potency than the entire Vaikuntha realm, although it's in the spiritual world. Because when Krishna manifests his pastimes in this realm, he brings the whole spiritual world with him. Although you may go there and you may see buildings and people and ordinary activities, what you're not, you're seeing simply the coverings of the material energy. You're not seeing the actual transcendental place. And because of lack of spiritual vision, the common living entity, or even someone who is elevated, sees things in a mundane way. But seeing through the eyes of purified consciousness, which comes by the process of devotional service to the Lord, one can gradually... Uh, understand and experience these transcendental realms, although they even appear on this planet in the material world. So Krishna's a place of birth is considered higher than the, the realm of Vaikuntha in the spiritual world. And higher than that, Jai Shisi Panchitattva Ki Jai.
Higher than that is the Sri, the twelve forests of Vrindavan, where Krishna performed many pastimes with his loving devotees. But there's a special place that's even higher than that. What do we mean by higher than that? It's just like you might find a big man in this world and uh, he has his place of birth and then he has his place of vacation, he has his place of work, he has his place of... He does different things at different places. But he has a special place that, you know, not too many people know about. <laughs> and he, this is where he has his most fun. And So Krishna also, he's like that. So there's different gradations of intensifications of spiritual energy invested in various levels of these spiritual places that appear in the material world. So that simply by going there, you get spiritual benefit. And performing service in these realms has great spiritual merit. Just like it says, if you perform any service in Sri Vrindavan Dham, it is equal to performing ten times, in other words, what you do here is ten times what we say emphasized in Sri Vrindavan. Those kids are jumping in those trees out there. They shouldn't be playing on the trees for two reasons. The trees are not to be played on, and the kids might get hurt playing on those trees. Someone should tell them. Uh, we see kids fall off the trees and break their legs, you know. So, so in the in these different levels of spiritual practice or different realms, Krishna intensifies each of the place more by a more intimate form of his own pastime. <laughs> Why is Govardhan superior to Vrindavan? <laughs> Everyone talks about Vrindavan, right? <laughs> and Vrindavan is the place Krishna performs many of his intimate pastimes with his devotees, even the gopis in, in various forests of Vrindavan. Why is Govardhan even higher? Because in that particular Leela, <clears throat> although Indra was such a rascal <laughs> that he wanted to somehow or other create havoc for the residents of Vrindavan because we know the story how his worship was interfered to by Krishna and said, why worship this demigod? Worship Govardhan Hill. Because Govardhan Hill gives you nice grass, trees, flowers, fruits, nice caves to rest in. Uh, there's also cows all over. Go it's, it's, you know, Govardhan Hill provides everything we need as, as a cowherd community. And so Indra became envious and tried to kill the residents of Vrindavan by sending torrential rains that actually was devastating. He sent the waters that are used at the end of the universe, at the end of the millennium to destroy the entire universe. The water was flooding so fast. But Krishna, seeing the situation, went and lifted up this gigantic hill and he held it on, over his head for seven days and all the residents of Vrindavan went into that hill and for seven days they were completely, not only protected, but at the same time they had direct darshan and association with Krishna. It was such a meeting of all the residents of, with Krishna that never would have normally happened if it wasn't for this apparent catastrophe by Indra. And so, although Indra you know, is acting in that way, he did something. He brought Krishna and the residents of Vrindavan together. <laughs> and there's no greater service than to bring the residents of Vrindavan together with Krishna. <laughs> so although his intentions were otherwise, he pleased Krishna by uh, arranging for his devotees to have loving pastimes with Krishna for seven days without interruption. And everyone had that darshan of the beautiful form of Krishna for seven full days holding up this wonderful hill. And everybody was completely protected, dried off, and no one was 
feeling any discomfort because of Indra pounding the hill with his with his uh, thunderbolts. In fact, even Govardhan Hill, who was being hit with the with the thunderbolts, because Krishna was touching Govardhan with his transcendental hand, Govardhan was feeling ecstasy and felt no discomfort, although being hit with these powerful thunderbolts by Indra. So, in that sense, Krishna performed so many wonderful pastimes with his devotees in that seven in those seven days that this Govardhan Hill is considered to be a superior pastime place than Sri Vrindavan Dham. There's much more to be said about Govardhan Hill, but we're just giving a little understanding of this place. But higher than Govardhan <laughs> is Sri Radha Kund, where this particular lake was created simply at another difficult situation, one bull called Aristasura. He was sent by Kamsa to kill Krishna and to cause havoc in the residence of Vrindavan. And Krishna, the bull was charging after Krishna, and Krishna was standing there just with his arm resting on his friend and just talking. And the bull just came and Krishna just stopped and took the bull by the horns and just threw him. <laughs> and then the bull turned around and came again. He was huge. His, his body was so tall that his tail went straight up, it was in the clouds. It says that when he was running on the on Vrindavan ground, his hooves were shaking the, the earth so much that the women of Vrindavan who were pregnant were having miscarriages. <laughs> That's how, how powerful his, his strides were. He was huge. And Krishna just, and the second time Krishna didn't want to be bothered with him. So he just took the bull by the horn, spun him around, and then just started kicking him until he was finished, Jai, and he won. <laughs> Jai Sri <see> Krishna. <laughs> it says, just like somebody takes a wet rag and just wrings it out, he finished his bull out <laughs> with no problem. And then, you know, that night Krishna was supposed to go and meet the gopis, and he was supposed to have, you know, pastimes with Radharani, and Radharani found out that a bull was killed that day by Krishna, and she said, don't come near me, you're contaminated. You killed a cow. Krishna said he's a demon. He said, she said, it doesn't matter, he's still a cow. You're supposed to be Gopal, you're protecting the cows. Therefore, don't come near me. So, he, Krishna said, well, what am I supposed to do? She said, you have to bathe in all the holy places to get purified. <laughs> she told that to Krishna. <laughs> Krishna said, well, why should I leave Vrindavan? So what he did is he kicked his heel in the ground, made a hole, and then he meditated and all the holy places poured their waters in this, in this place and it was called Shamakund. Krishna took his bath in all the holy places right there in Vrindavan in this lake he created instantaneously. And then he said, okay, now I'm purified. But then you, Radharani, you're siding with a demon, therefore you are also offensive, so you're unpure. So you have to take bath in, in, in these lakes also to get free from this, this, this offense of siding with a demon. Radharani said, I'm not going to take bath in your kund because you, you put all your sinful activities in there. <laughs> so I'm not going to. So she said, I'll make my own kund. So she sent out all her gopis to Manasi Ganga, which was not in, within the area, and they just brought buckets of water. And then all the gopis took all their bangles off and started digging big hole on this hole, and they dug this huge hole. And then uh, Radharani put the gopis were bringing water from Manasi Ganga, and then the holy places were realizing, while well, Radharani's creating her own kun, maybe we should also go in our own kun. So they came and prostrated themselves at the feet of Radharani and said, "Could we also enter into your kun?" And because she's very merciful. She said yes. And then she took bath there. And that's how the appearance of Radha Kund came. So Radha Kund is considered to be non-different than Srimati Radharani. So therefore it is considered to be the holiest of holy places. And therefore one who, who attains pure Krishna consciousness is qualified to worship Srimati Radharani by sitting on the banks of Radha Kund in service to her like that. It says if you go to Radha Kund 
and bathe once, you can get pure love of God just by one bathing. Yeah. Of course, that bathing has to be done in the proper consciousness. I remember in the year 2000, we were doing Parikram in that area with Radhanath Swami and a, and a group of devotees. And on the way, we met Sachi Nandana Maharaj. He was living at Radhakun at the time. And then he joined our Parikram and we wound up at Radhakun. And then Sachi Nandana Maharaj, under the direction of Radha, uh, Radhanath Swami, spoke about the glories of Radhakun and he gave us very detailed instructions on how to bathe in Radhakund. And we all went in, there was hundreds of devotees that night, we all went into Radhakund. And you go because you go in the mood of service to Radharani. When Prabhupada brought his disciples to Radhakund many, many years before that, the devotees didn't know really how to approach Srimati Radharani's holy bathing place. So they went in the water and started splashing and having like, you know, fun, just run, splashing around. Prabhupada became like, he became like, wow, well, like fire. <laughs> he became so angry. This is Radharani's very bathing place, is not, and you're just playing like little kids. He said, all right, nobody ever goes in Radhakund again. Can't go in. So for years, in the ISKCON society, we were told we could not go into Radhakund because of what Prabhupada. But then Prabhupada said, if you want to go, you take three drops on your head, you put your obeisances at the stairs, and you offer your prayers to Radharani, you pray for her mercy, you pray for her her to give you bhakti, and then that's that's a bath, three three drops. But then we understood that, okay, it's, a, it's not wrong to go in Radhakund, but you must go in the right consciousness. <laughs> because if you go into the wrong consciousness, you will also get a different kind of experience and reaction. So that night we all went in with folded hands, praying to Srimati Radharani. The water was cold. <laughs> it was at nine o'clock at night. It was in the month of, I think it was around January. <laughs> It was cold, <laughs> but the coldness didn't exp it didn't seem to be so much of a factor because the experience when you came out you felt you were purified you felt like all your sins had been washed away your consciousness was completely pure. How many of you bathed in Radhakund? Oh, like that? Oh wow, many of you. Huh? So it's a, it's a holy place, but to attain that level of consciousness to practice bhakti on the, on the banks of Radhakund is only for very, very, very special and rare souls. One cannot surreptitiously or pretentiously just go to Radhakund and sit there and worship. Raghunath Das Goswami made his bhajan kutir at the banks of Radhakund. What happened was the after Lord see Radhakund was lost to everyone's vision after Krishna disappeared. So for four thousand five hundred years afterwards, no one really knew where Radhakund was. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he came to that area, he was looking for Radhakund. He saw this little pond in the middle of a paddy field and he started taking his bath. His devotees who were with him, they were saying, what is he doing in his pond? And he was in exit. He came out he said, this is Srimati Radharani's birthplace, a uh, bathing place. And then he ordered his disciples to re-excavate that and fill it with transcendental waters from the holy places. And again, Radhakun was re resurrected to the, to the world. But then after some time, there was some difficulty. Um, because if you look, uh, what was that? Raghunath Das Goswami, who was one of the six Goswamis, started to reside on the banks of Radha Kund. But he noticed that 
you know, Shama Kund and Radha Kund, they come together and there's a place called, what's it called, Gori Kund? Gora Kund? Or Gori Kund? The, the junction between Radha Kund and Shama Kund is a very special place. Now, they were trying to excavate that place and make it even more, what we say, naturally beautiful. There were five trees on the banks of that on Shamakun that were in the way of the excavation. So Ra Raghunath Das Goswami, he wanted to help. One day, one great rich man went to Badrinath. Badrinath is in the Himalayas, completely you know, thousands of miles away from Radha Kund. And he was praying to Badrinath, Badri Vishal, uh, my dear Lord, please give me some service. Bhadri Vatsal appeared to that devotee in a dream that night. He said, you go to Radha Kund. One of my devotees there wants to excavate Radharani's birthplace. You pay for it. <laughs> and that next day he left. He traveled. It took him you know, a long time. He finally got there and found Raghunath Das Goswami. Raghunath Das Goswami was... He wanted to do something, but he was thinking, how will I ever get the money? And I'm a renunciate. I'm simply here on the banks. But Krishna arranged it himself, and then this man paid for the excavation. So while the excavation was going on, uh, Raghunath Das Goswami had a dream. And in the dream, the trees that were on the banks of Shamakun said, please don't cut us down. We're the five Pandavas. <laughs> Because the Pandavas were residing after they had left the world, they had decided to re reside on the banks of Radha Kund. So you see that Shama Kund is not so even, right? But Radha Kund is square, completely square. So there's a little unevenness between Shama Kunds because of them, they didn't touch those five trees. And later those five trees disappeared and went back to the spiritual world, the whole tree. <laughs> the whole tree. So. And then, uh, of course, uh, Raghunath Das Goswami did other works there. He set up uh, the tongue of Govardhan. That was that famous pastime where people were excavating at the land and they hit a rock and the rock started to bleed. <laughs> and then, and that night, I think it was Raghunath Das Goswami had a dream and said, Govardhan appeared to him in the dream and said, you you cut my tongue, <laughs> actually your tongue. So then the Raghunath Goswami stopped the excavation and set up a a little bhajan kutir right there. You can go there and it's the tongue of Govardhan, mm -hmm. which is the, the Govardhan Hill. See who is Govardhan Hill? When Krishna told Radharani, "I want to go to the material world before my pastimes." Uh, Krishna sent, before he sent, before he came to the material world to perform his pastimes, he sent Jamuna and Govardhan Hill to precede him so he could perform his pastimes in the area of these two transcendental. So Jamuna River and Govardhan Hill are residents of the spiritual world. They appear in the material world in the land of Vrindavan area to assist Krishna in his transcendental pastimes. So when Krishna comes, he brings his entourage, his devotees, and he also brings his paraphernalia in the form of these transcendental pastimes. But who is actually Govardhan Hill? When Krishna wanted to show his love for Radharani, he manifested this hill as an expression of his love for Radharani, and it appeared in this material world as Sri Govardhan Hill. <laughs> So Govardhan Hill is not simply a mountain. If you look at it, it looks like rocks, dirt, and so many other things. But that's material vision. Material vision is everyone in the material world sees things wrong. Every, everyone's vision is colored. Bhagavatam says karmatmaka. Karmatmaka because vision is colored by material desires. So seeing with eyes is not seeing. Seeing with ears helps to see by the way of the heart. 
So when we learn to see, trans, we hear transcendental knowledge, the heart becomes purified, the mind becomes clear, and we can understand the transcendental nature of Krishna's pastimes and these holy places also. So this is the highest spiritual attainment, Sri Radhakund, as is mentioned here. So on the, the, the anniversary of the killing of the demon Aristasura, which was the advent of Radhakund, there's a big ceremony there. And it was it how many people come? Were you there that night for uh, Bahulastami? How many people were there? Many, like hundred thousand or more? Huh? Thousands and thousands of people, all bathing at the same time in this lake called Radhakund. And that happens at midnight, right? At midnight. It's in October, so it's not so warm either, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, 24 hours the bathing goes on, people just continue to come. So devotees should take the opportunity to visit these holy places because visiting holy places is one of the principles of spiritual purification. It's a very powerful form of spiritual pur purification. It's one of the, the nine limbs of bhakti. And the one of the limbs of bhakti is serving Krishna by serving his lotus feet. So Krishna's lotus feet appears in these holy places and makes the place holy. So by going to these holy places, taking the dust of the holy places on our head and rolling in the dust, taking the association of these holy places, hearing from pastimes by the great souls who appear there, one becomes transcendentally uh, accelerated in their practice of Krishna consciousness. <laughs> so Prabhupada wrote many times, devotees should go to these holy places at least once a year and take the mercy of these dams. Right, Tirta Kirti, you've been to Radhakund also? Yeah. How many times? Three times? Yeah, okay. I've gave, I gave the name Tirta Kirti to this transcendental lady over here. <laughs> Tirta Kirti means one, it's a name for Krishna who's worshipped in all the holy places. Kirti means fame, and Tirta means holy place. One who's famous, whose worship is famous in all holy places. Uh, you, you've been all over the holy places. Huh? She has a, and in, in, in um, in the birthplace of Lord Nityananda, she has her own room there that's set aside by the residents there. They all know her as the mother of uh, <laughs> the devotees there. She comes every year, stays a few months sometimes, right? So this is, this is Krishna consciousness, to visit these holy places. And then when we come back to our services and wherever we're living, we're spiritually in, in, empowered, spiritually enlightened, and spiritually what we say, uh, what's the word? Accelerated. It's a great. So, visiting holy places is not optional. Everyone should do it. <laughs> like that. To get the mercy. And Radhakund is one of the holiest of all holy places like that. So this is verse 9, describing the different levels of the different types of holy places, ending with the topmost Sri Radhakund. The next verse, we're going to do 9, 10, and 11, changes the, f the format a little bit. And I'll just read the verse and skip the purport because it's quite lengthy. But it also mentions these holy places. Okay? You ready for the next verse? Okay. In the Shastras, it is said that of all types of fruit of workers, he was advanced in knowledge of the higher values of life is favored by the by Lord Shihari. Out of many such persons who are advanced in knowledge, jnanis, one who is practically liberated by virtue of his knowledge may take the de de devotional service. Okay, one who has knowledge becomes detached, becomes liberated, then takes the devotional service. He is superior to others. However, 
one who has actually attained prema, pure love of Krishna, is superior to that person. The gopis are exalted above the advanced devotees because they are always totally dependent upon Sri Krishna, the transcendental cowherd boy. Among the gopis, Srimati Radharani is the most dear to Krishna. Her lake, Kunda, is, a prof is as profoundly dear to Lord Krishna as this most beloved of the gopis. Who then will not reside at Ranakund in a spiritual body surcharged with ecstatic devotional feelings? Aprakrat Bhava render loving service to the divine couple Shishi Radha Govinda who performed their, lila, their Astakalya Lila, their eternal eightfold daily pastimes. Indeed, those who execute devotional service on the banks of Radha Kund are the most fortunate persons in the universe. So we should aspire for advancement and, and devotional service to come to the stage of qualifying ourselves to what we say, develop the consciousness of Vrindavan. What is the consciousness of Vrindavan? What is Vrindavan consciousness? Vrindavan consciousness is not simply thinking about a place. Vrindavan consciousness is that I am Krishna's eternal servant, Krishna is my only object of love and activity. I absorb myself in his service. That's Vrindavan consciousness. The more we practice this loving service, the more we attain to our spiritual nature. The more we attain to our spiritual nature, the more all of our, all our desires become fulfilled perfectly, completely, and beyond our imagination. On the spiritual platform, everything is complete. On the material platform, everything is deeply <laughs> incomplete, repeat, not sweet. You want to get out of there and run as fast as you can on your two feet. <laughs> and this is the material world. <laughs> this is the way it is. But in the, because in this material world, no one can find happiness. Why? We were hearing today earlier, why is there so much suffering in this world? Because it's, it's designed like that. This world is designed for you to suffer. Haribo. <laughs> Everybody knows that, right? Old age is suffering, disease is suffering, you get a wife and then she doesn't like you. And you get a husband, you just pray for a nice spouse, and then you get a louse, and he's, he's more like a mouse. <laughs> and you want a house, <laughs> and it just doesn't happen. So, you know, you just make all your plans for happiness in the world, and you know what? You just spend your whole life making plans for happiness, and that's all. <laughs> And at the end, you realize it's just a bunch of planning. That's all. <laughs> Nothing ever really manifests. That's the nature of this material world. It's a prison house. We want to enjoy, but we can't. We want to be free, but we're limited. We want to live forever, we got to die. We want to be healthy, we get sick. Right? We want to fulfill our desires, they just don't happen. And even if we do fulfill them, after some time, things change and... To become unfulfilled. It's just the way this world is. Krishna designed. He said, you want to leave me? Okay, here's a place you can go. Have fun. <laughs> Good luck. And when you get tired, come on back. <laughs> so, this is, this is this material world is designed just to make it miserable for you so you want to get out. <laughs> right? Right. That's the idea. The idea is that bec is the su suffering is actually a form of mercy because it teaches you, you can't be happy here. <laughs> Prabhupada said, if if fire did not burn, if you stuck your stuck your hand in the fire, you would lose your hand and you wouldn't even know it because the burn there's no burning sensation. Therefore, a person, a child, would stick his hand in a fire, lose his hand because of the fire, but not feel the pain. So this world is designed that it gives you so much pain that you want to run from the pain or you want something that is more pleasurable. So therefore, in this material world, everyone is trying to adjust 
the material energy in such a way as to find some kind of pleasure and satisfaction, but you just wound up adjusting. <laughs> And then the whole thing is just over. <laughs> you adjust until there's, a, there's nothing else to adjust. <laughs> and then, you know, you wound up, you know, what do you do? You just get old and you die, right? That's the whole thing, right? I mean, there's a whole class of philosophers who are trying to figure out what is the purpose of life. And some of them come up with the idea, there's really no purpose anyway. <laughs> Nothing makes sense. This world does not make sense. <laughs> it's a place for idiots. <laughs> it's called a fool's paradise. <laughs> if you call it, you know, if, if you have a paradise, but it's it, it's it's just for fools. You think why go to a place where there's only fools? <laughs> right? You know, you work hard all your life, and what do you get? You just get a grave, that's all. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> you get, so you can rest after all the work. <laughs> yeah. And nobody appreciates anybody else. Even if someone sacrifices for us, so his family at the end of life, the family says, what did you ever do for me, you know? <laughs> it's just the way the world is, you know? Bhakti Siddhanta said it is a place of cheaters and cheated. Somebody is trying to cheat somebody, others are being cheated by these cheaters, that's all. We have to understand clearly what this world is about. And then we can under then we can start moving forward in our spiritual life. Therefore, one of the prerequisites for spiritual advancement is to understand there's no happiness here. Not some, none. <laughs> And even what you call happiness is another form of suffering. Because as we were hearing today earlier from Bhuta Bhavana, happiness is simply a relief from the pain of existence. If you, hunger is a form of pain. Eating is to, to somehow reduce that pain of hunger. And that's called happiness. You're lusty, you try sex life, you get a real little relief, you think you're happy. And, but all you're doing is relieving the pain of lust which burns like fire, like that. So, and then, of course, simply that's simply a temporary experience, and then the pain comes back again. And you can never satisfy lust. You can never satisfy. You just keep doing the same thing over and over until you can't do it anymore, and that's called death. <laughs> and then in the, middle of the, mid in the meantime, you have to go to a doctor to get cured so you can keep going on and suffer some more. <laughs> This is, the, this is the nature of this world. Uh, the nature of material happiness is like trying to catch smoke. You ever try to catch smoke? There it is. Where did it go? <laughs> I see it. It's flying in the air. No smoke. You, see, you can. It looks good, right? She looks good, he looks good, that looks good, you know. It's just looks. <laughs> it's called the flashing light, but behind it is just a bunch of bulbs, you know, just going, e -e -e, come here, come here. We don't have anything to offer, but it looks good. <laughs> it's called material light. And so you play the game until you can't play it anymore, and then you die. But the devotees are in knowledge, and the devotees know that why play this game, which simply ends in frustration and ultimate defeat? And then you have to take another body and do the same thing again. And there's no one guarantee you get a better body. So Krishna manifests the spiritual world in the material world, performs his pastimes. Why does he come to this material world? He's got all his entourage. He's got everything he ever dreams of in the spiritual world for himself. But he comes just to attract our minds and hearts to his pastimes in this material world so we can actually enter into these pastimes and become purified and then attain the qualifications of going back to the spiritual world. So these manifestations of these spiritual places in the material world are the ultimate form of Krishna's mercy. Simply to have a, give us a chance to take part in these pastimes and become purified, preparing ourselves 
to go back home, back to Godhead. And Prabhupada said, back to Godhead. That means we're going back to a place that we left. It's not like you're returning somewhere. You're not going there for the first time. <laughs> you were there in your pure spiritual existence. Somehow or other you're here and now you have a material body. Your pure spiritual existence still is with you. It's still you. It never changes, but it's covered by this material energy and material body. So when we become fully Krishna conscious, we return to our spiritual place. This is our home. That's why he says, back home, back to Godhead. <laughs> Not like you're going there for the first time. It's just we forgot, because material energy makes us forget. That's all. That's the quality of material energy. We see that day to day we forget things even in our own day to day life. We can sometimes we can't even remember our names. <laughs> How old are you? Uh, let me let me see. Uh, I was born in nineteen forties. Oh, is it, is it? Oh yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, um, uh, you better ask my wife. I forgot. <laughs> so. You know, you, you get old, you forget. Even when you, when you, you know, childhood is forgetfulness, youthhood is another form of forgetfulness. So we forget. So we've really, we've completely unable to remember our spiritual existence in the spiritual world. But that's our home. Because we're not, if someone says, you know, why are you wasting your time in spiritual life? Why don't you just get a job, have fun, and just enjoy this world? What do you say to them? You say to them, My dear sir, madam, are you the body or are you a soul? If you're the body, then your philosophy makes complete sense and I'll join you. But if my philosophy is right, if you, I'm a spiritual being, then what I say is actually the, the correct understanding. So that's the difference. People think they're the body, therefore they, they promulgate, propagate material life is the goal. But devotees know, I'm not this body. I'm not this body. And therefore, I am something spiritual. And therefore, my existence and my activities are of the nature of spirit. So living in this world means to somehow take a thorn and take... A thorn gets stuck in your foot. So and that's painful. So what do you do? The Shastras say you take another thorn and you pull that thorn out with that thorn and you throw both thorns away. So this world has a purpose. It helps us get out of the consciousness of material life and then when we're finished, we have nothing to do with this material world again. And you go back to God and you just realize you'll be able to remember your existence in this world and you'll just remember it as a bad dream. That's and once you go back to the spiritual world, it'll be like you never left. You'll see your material existence as a flash in eternal time that is so short that it was immeasurably short. It's less than a second by eternal time. A second is even too long. And that means all your millions of births in this material world. So this is our actual existence and therefore, this text is teaching us these are the spiritual world has actually come to the material world to give us the benefit of the spiritual world so we can prepare ourselves to go back to the, to re, to the actual spiritual world, the, the ma unmanifested form of the spiritual world where Krishna resides there eternally with his loving devotees. So this is... Uh, this says, Who... Who's, who is actually intelligent would not want to reside on the banks of Radhakund. That means one who takes up pure Krishna consciousness is intelligent. One who achieves that consciousness actually wants to uh, practice devotional service in the ultimate form of spiritual loving relationship. And Radhakund is the highest place. Why is Radhakund high? Because Radharani is most dear to Krishna because Radharani can only Radharani can fulfill all the desires of Krishna no one else 
So one who gets the mercy of Radharani gets the mercy of Krishna. <laughs> and Prabhupada says, Radharani is so merciful. There's a story where uh, Radharani was walking with Lalita, and they were walking together in Vrindavan. And before then, two boys were playing, and they were, they were playing around, and they saw this little baby jackal. You know the story of the jackal? So this ja they, they started to chase the jackal. And the jackal ran into this little hole in the ground. So the boys, being mischievous, put some brush on the outside and lit a fire. And the jackal was stuck in the hole and it was screaming. And the boys just left. Very cruel. So Radharani's walking along with Lalita and she hears this jackal crying. She says, Lalita, this is Vrindavan. How is it possible someone can be suffering in this land of Vrindavan? She said, Lalita, go find out where is those cries coming from. Lalita goes and she sees the situation. She brushes the fire away, takes the little baby jackal into her arms and brings it, brings it to Radharani. And Radharani bestows her loving kindness on the jackal. So Radharani is so kind that she even wants to give her mercy to an ordinary jackal. So what to speak of us? So Radharani is very merciful. Therefore, Prabhupada says, we fast all the way to midnight on John Mastami, but on Radhastami, half day. <laughs> <laughs> so who's more merciful? <laughs> Therefore, Prabhupada said, mother is always more kinder than father. <laughs> so Radharani is our eternal mother. And she has manifested her lake in this world for our transcendental uh, experience to get her mercy like that, which is rarely attained. Very few people can attain this place of Radhakund, I mean, in, their, in, in this particular body. I mean, to live at the banks of Radhakund and perform their bhajan there. Some people go there surreptitiously, thinking that they just by going there, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati went there. He was invited by the Babaji's of Vrindavan to come. He came there. He saw the situation. He spoke on Sri Yishupanishads. <laughs> Didn't spoke, speak anything about Krishna Lila. They thought, what is this saintly person coming to here? And he's, he's giving us this philosophy of Yishupanishads. Why doesn't he speak about Radha Krishna Lila? And then later on he said these, these persons were not qualified to hear about Krishna's pastimes. Because they're just not, they just came to Radhakund with not the pro proper adhikari. Adhikari means the proper qualifications like that. So one can visit Radhakund, take the mercy of Sri Rati Radharani, but to live there means to be in pure Krishna consciousness like that. So. And I'll read the last verse, verse 11. Out of the many objects of favored delight and all the loving damsels of Rajabhumi, Radharani is extremely the most treasured objects of Krishna's love. And in every respect, her divine kund is described by great sages, similarly dear to him. So out of all the devotees, of all the manifestations of Krishna's eternal loving associates, Radharani is the highest. Undoubtedly, Radha kund is very carefully attained, very rarely attained even by great devotees. Therefore, it is even more difficult for ordinary devotees to attain. If one simply bathes once within these holy waters, once, one's pure love for Krishna is fully aroused. That's how merciful Radharani. And Prabhupada goes on in this purport to describe the glories of Radha Kund like that. So this concludes this essay, or these, this text on the 11 verses, ending up with pure, loving bhakti to Srimati Radharani in her holy place called Srimati Radhakund, like that. Shamakund and Radhakund. And Govardhan Hill, Radhakund and Shamakund sit at the base of a Govardhan Hill, like that. So devotees should take time and visit these holy places. 
If you miss the opportunity in this life, it's a great loss. <laughs> a great loss. It's like having an opportunity to get the greatest treasure. So we can always make plans. We're always making plans to go somewhere, right? <laughs> anyway. Okay, any questions? Radha Kun, yes, Sri, Sri Devi. Maharaj, you mentioned about materialists and their plan making and their confidence in their own material plans. Yeah. What happens when finally they realize, oh my gosh, I'm going to die now, now it's all over? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the curtain has been pulled. <laughs> And so even the materialists now, they're trying to figure out how to live forever. There was that one uh, famous cartoonist, Walt Disney. You heard of Walt Disney? Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. Some, you know, little version of Rod and Krishna in mouse forms. You know? <laughs> Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, you know. <laughs> Two mouse. Donald Duck and Quacky, you know. So. Anyway... Uh, so this cartoonist, he was he was quite wealthy and famous. So he told he wanted to live forever. So he said, when I die, because they had this program where you can take your body and freeze it, and then keep all the components of the body intact through this deep freeze. So he paid a large amount of money to have his body frozen at the time after he died. So he died, like everybody does. <laughs> and they did that. They put his body in his freeze. And then the idea is that the scientists will eventually come up with the secret of life and inject it back into the body. And then there's old Walt again with Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse, part two. You know. <laughs> so what happened was his relatives wanted the fortune. They said, you know, he's our whatever relative and therefore he's got all this money. We, you know, we're the, we're the heirs to the fortune. And so they were contesting the fact that, but, you know, everyone else was saying, well, he's going to come back. You can't take his fortune. <laughs> we're saving it for when he returns. <laughs> so there was a court case and finally one night one of the relatives snuck into the room where his body was in the freeze, and they he pulled they pulled the plug out of the wall. So that so that was the end of Walt. <laughs> so the, the materialists they try to live forever by doing this artificial means. What is that thing? It's called something geranics. What is that? There's a big, huh? Chirogenics or something? Anybody know the terminology? Where they can take your brain and freeze it, and then after they find the secret of life, they bring you back. They float your your brain in space and with these different satellites, and you're you're circling the globe in your former brain. It's a mad place, I told you. You don't believe. Me. <laughs> and you pay thousands and thousands of dollars so you can you know somehow return and come back and be more miserable again <laughs> and die another time you can so this is the material world so yeah the materialists always think you know we can somehow or other live forever in these bodies or we can enjoy forever like that but they refuse to take up the process which is the process of immortality Prabhupada said this process can teach you how to become immortal. We can, con we have conquered over death by this process of Krishna consciousness. And it's not a, a simple, it's not a statement to attract people, it's actually a fact. Death comes to the material body, but death is not there for the soul. As long as we think with the material body, we'll experience the, the horrors and, and fears of death. But we understand that we don't die because the soul is eternal. So what dies is the body. But the thing is, the body never di doesn't die because the body is never alive in the first place. Body <laughs> won't. Did you know you're in a dead body? <laughs> 
Your body is alive because you're in it. As soon as you go, Haribo, you can just kick it, throw it under the car, you know, step on it, nobody cares. <laughs> because you're in it, it's important and it's valuable. We're not minimizing that part. But the point is, as soon as you leave that body, it's just a lump of matter. It's no different than this, this desk, you know. It's just dead. It's jutta. It has no life. So life begins when the soul enters the womb and the, the body grows because of the presence of the soul given by the mother's womb. But at the same time, when that soul leaves the body, then the body no longer functions. So the appearance of the soul in matter gives life, and the disappearance of the soul in that same matter is death. So there's no life to matter. Matter is simply dead. What is life is soul. So all of us here, we're all living, right? That's because you are a spiritual being. You're not this body. This body is dead. You're just moving this thing around. <laughs> you kind of push it around, kind of move it up the stairs, something like that. Oh, man. <laughs> it's getting old. <laughs> you try to make it look good. You, put, you, know, you look in the mirror in the morning and you kind of do all these things, you know, curl the eyelashes and fill in the cracks, sand it down, you know. <laughs> <laughs> make it look good, you know, then you go out on parikram, <laughs> you see how nice I look, <laughs> it's not you, <laughs> take, <laughs> it's a, we do that, it's called morning darshan, right? <laughs> Guy's combing his hair, you know. <laughs> he's getting ready for the appearance, you know, so he can give darshan to. <laughs> he's just he's just practicing, you know? <laughs> and he goes out and then he performs for everyone else. <laughs> yeah, so you know, this is this place is a joke. <laughs> we have we were preaching one time. <laughs> We were preaching one time, and uh, we were going to different radio stations doing this program. And we had developed this, it was in New Vrindavan, so we had gotten off on Prabhupada's movement, and we had long hair and beards. <laughs> so, um, the person who was escorting us around was taking us to different, he was a, he was a, uh, a newspaper person. He was doing a, a reports on every place we appeared. So he was driving us around. There was about five or six of us in the car. So one time he was speaking. He said, you guys are the Hare Krishnas. So one of the leaders said, no, we're not the Hare Krishnas. We're the Hare Krishnas. Because <laughs> we had long hairs and beards. <laughs> so he said, because we were very serious, and we're doing, and then all of a sudden a joke came in, <laughs> and he said, "Oh, you guys got a sense of humor." <laughs> and then one of the devotees said, "Yes, Krishna has a sense of humor also. Just take a look in the mirror. <laughs> That's Krishna's joke." <laughs> You think, that's me. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not you. It can never be you. <laughs> it's simply your body that you're in, that's all. Yeah. And then this body will forget this life, and we're next life will be doing the same thing, maybe in a diff completely different body. <laughs> so you can't stop getting bodies. So... We're not this body, we're simply a nobody. <laughs> and nobody cares <laughs> about your body. <laughs> so when you start to see the material world and for what it is, it's just a funny place. <laughs> it's, it's totally ridiculous, nothing makes sense. <laughs> 
And it's, it's arranged that way simply so we don't want to stay here. It's Krishna's way of saying, come back to me. <laughs> come back to me. But we're, it's, it's called a prison house. So in you, if you're in the prison house and you think, I just got to get a better cell, <laughs> that's all. I, I'm in a low-class cell, I just got to get a better cell. That's the basic activity of the inhabitants of the material world, trying to find a better place within the prison. <laughs> that's all. It's simply a prison. No one can fulfill their desires. No one can stay here. <laughs> In one sense, it's good that you can't stay here. <laughs> but the thing is, you can't stay in this particular body. We, so we want to go back to Krishna. And here's the formula, this process of pure devotional service, which Rupa Goswami mentions in the eighth verse, which we discussed earlier, the chanting of the holy names of the Lord is the way to purify our consciousness and qualify us to associate with Krishna in his various types of pastimes. So there's no greater way to elevate our consciousness than chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare. Kali Kale, Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar. So people sometimes say, well, how does Krishna, he appears at every age, so how does he appear in this age? He appears in his name. Kali Kale, in the age of Kali, Nam Rup, the form of the name Krishna Avatar. So Krishna descends in sound, spiritual sound. So the name of Krishna is Krishna. No difference. Hmm. One devotee was giving a lecture one time and Prabhupada was sitting listening to his disciples speak. And the devotee was speaking and said, and Krishna is in his name. And Prabhupada stopped him and he said, where in his name is he? <laughs> and then the devotee, <laughs> I mean, which part of it? He <laughs> said, in the K or the R? <laughs> or... Then the devotee got the message. No, Krishna is not in his name. He is his name. <laughs> so that same deity of Krishna you see on the altar is the same, is manifested in the same form as his name. The same person who lives in the spiritual world, the source of everything, Lord Sri Krishna, has manifested himself in his name. So therefore, there's no greater form of worship than chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra especially in this age, because it's been highly recommended as the means for self-realization and attainment of all spiritual goals. So, in the name, Krishna's pastimes are there, Krishna's qualities, Krishna's forms. So we have to practice. Practice chanting as more and more and more. Just chant, chant, chant. When Prabhupada was in New York, and someone asked him, one reporter, Swamiji, you're chanting Hare Krishna. What do you get out of chanting Hare Krishna? Prabhupada said, we get chanting from chanting. <laughs> the more you chant, the more you chant. <laughs> you know, the devotee was thinking, well, maybe you get some fame, you get some recognition or something. No, you actually get more chant, chanting. So chanting leads to chanting and chanting. More chanting means the heart becomes more and more purified and one can, Krishna reveals himself through the sound of his name. So wherever the, ch the chanting of the holy name of the Lord is, no matter where it is in the universe, that place is a holy place. So we entitled one of our books called Holy Jail, right? How can a jail be holy? Because we said that the people who are living in the jail, who are chanting Hare Krishna and pra trying to serve the Lord in whatever way they can while being in jail, that place is also a holy place. <laughs> like that. So, so a holy place manifested by holy people and holy activities like that. So we have to understand where the essence is. So this book, Nectar of Instructions, teaches us the process, but it teaches us in very 
sutra-like ways of the essence of the practice of Krishna consciousness, beginning with controlling the mind and senses, uh, avoiding those things that are detrimental to our spiritual life, accepting those things that are favorable, associating with devotees and exchanging loving relationships, uh, understanding how to associate with devotees, avoiding criticizing of devotees, chanting, uh, practicing chanting the holy name until we come to the stage of, of pure chanting, and then gradually moving, moving into the spiritual realm like that. This is so if you haven't read Nectar of Instructions, take time. It's a very short book. Prabhupada's purports have made the very difficult texts easily understandable. And this is one of the most important books in uh, the ISKCON library. Yes? There's, they say there's there's no real demons in the spiritual world because the spiritual world is a place where only great souls reside. But in order to for Krishna to perform his pastimes of killing demons, there's a semblance of demons that appear there, but they're not real demons. In order for Krishna to perform this particular pastime, that's all. Just for Krishna's pleasure, that's all. They're not demons, they're just devotees who have enacted these particular pastimes for the pleasure of Krishna. Mm -hmm. Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur talks about that. Not real demons, but it appears that there's a semblance of demons there. Just so Krishna can perform his pastime. See, the spiritual world means to give pleasure to Krishna. And Krishna, because Krishna is so great, his desire to experience pleasure is as great as he is, and what is the what is the qualification? What is the quality that makes things pleasurable? Variety. They say variety is the spice of life. So in the spiritual world, there's so much forms of variety of of spiritual pleasure, just to give Krishna pleasure, like that. This material world is a reflection of the spiritual world where we see so much variety here. Just imagine if every, everybody looked the same. <laughs> You'd be looking at yourself all the time. <laughs> Pretty boring, wouldn't it? <laughs> if there was only one type of food, and if there was only one color, one color, one type of food, everybody had the same name and everybody looked the same. <laughs> and all of the same, there's only one activity. <laughs> it would be, I mean, it's already bad enough. <laughs> it would be even worse. So, wherever there's variety, there's an opportunity for spice or making life a little bit more exciting. So, in the spiritual world, variety is the source of existence. So, it says that Krishna performed so many pastimes that Anantasesh, who is holding up the universes on his head, is chanting the glories of Krishna's pastimes, and he's been doing it from time immemorial, and he hasn't repeated the same one over. Now, Krishna is unlimited in all aspects of himself, so variety is unlimited also in the spiritual world. We can't imagine the spiritual world because it doesn't fit into our material understanding. Spirit is, spirit is unlimited, material is limited. If you try to understand something unlimited with an unlimited mentality, how far can you go? <laughs> well, it's unlimited. What does it mean? Well, it means it's unlimited. <laughs> That's all you can do. You can't understand it. How can you understand? Just like it says, the residents of the spiritual world, they eat. But nothing disappears in the spiritual world because everything is spiritual. So if you eat something, it seems like it's gone. But in the spiritual world, you eat something and it's still there. <laughs> so you try to figure out that one out. <laughs> you can't. It just doesn't make logical sense. 
because spiritual logic is just not logic. <laughs> I mean, it just not it doesn't fit into material logic. You know, and you just can't put it. You know, he's trying to trying to put a round, you know, square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't work. So a spirit. Therefore, Jiva Goswami says the nature of Krishna is achintya. Achintya means inconceivable. If God wasn't inconceivable, then He would be on the same level as we are. What, what, how could you speak of the greatness of God if he's understandable by us? <laughs> he's not understandable by us. <laughs> it's just like two ants come together and they start speaking. Hey, you know, I think there's something above us. The other ant says, nah, you're just imagining. <laughs> and you look down at the ant and you say, uh, how much do they know about me? <laughs> You can see the ants, but how much are they aware of you? They have no understanding of your existence. So that's our, we have this ant-like mentality. We're trying to understand something that's way beyond our ability to understand with our minds. But it's understandable gradually through revelation. Therefore, spiritual knowledge comes by revelation, and revelation comes by pure devotional service. Like that. Yeah. It's funny, when I had a question in this answer, I was going to say, if the soul is such as another, full of knowledge, then how can you know God? So then you just answer it. It's revelation. Krishna reveals his knowledge to you when you become qualified. He reveals it within your heart. It's like eating. Does anyone have to tell you when you had enough? They can't experience what you're experiencing, what you're eating. But at one point you know, oh, I'm satisfied, that's it. So that is an experience. So transcendental knowledge is an experience. It's not simply an idea or an intellectual arrangement. It's an experience. You experience these things by your, the power of your pure devotional service. You experience the presence of Krishna. You experience the presence of Krishna's pastimes. It's not the same. No, because when he comes to the material world, it's more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada said, you know, just like you go to the gym and you work out, you know, it's got to, you want to flex your muscles and, you know, get a little action. So Krishna likes to fight. <laughs> so he said, you can't fight in the spiritual world because everyone is a, a devotee. So he comes to the material world to fight. And in the, in the spiritual world, they're fighting, but it's not a real fight, it's more play. Here he fights. <laughs> <laughs> the material world is a place for fighting, right? Everybody's fighting. <laughs> right? Everybody fights with everybody. Prabhupada said, where do you get that fighting propensity? It's coming from Krishna. Because Krishna likes to fight. <laughs> so he comes to the material world, it's a good place to work out. <laughs> yeah, it's a place of fighting. Uh, let's see, I think we got Sri Devi and anybody else? Any other questions? Yes, Shasha. I just want to ask, uh, you were talking about Govardhan. Who he is? Is he Krishna or some other person? Govardhan? No, he's an eternal associate of Krishna. Was he also Govardhan Shila, so we are worshiping the Sunday That's Krishna. The Shila is none different than Krishna. He comes in that form. Each of the rocks in, in, on Govardhan Hill is actually worshipable as Krishna himself. There's no difference. Krishna took the form of Govardhan Hill when he was here in the material world in order to accept the worship of the residents of Vrindavan. But Krishna, but Govardhan Hill is a manifestation of Krishna's love for Radharani in the spiritual world. And it came in the form of this mountain to assist Krishna in his pastimes here. Mm -hmm. But he's been, and 
He's he's an eternal associate of Krishna. He's pure spiritual energy. There's nothing material about Govardhan. You know, it looks like a rock, but you know, but it's because it's coming from the spiritual world. Its appearance is only one thing, but actually, it's Krishna himself. And those who worship the Shilas, they actually know they have the experience they're worshiping Krishna in the form of this rock. Huh? How is it possible? Because if he is associate of Krishna, Govardhan, mm-hmm. we are worshiping him like Krishna himself. So what is understanding? It's it's an, Krishna is absolute. He expands himself into himself in different forms of himself for the sake of lila. It's like we say, Angani yes yes sakal. No, what is that? What is that verse? Angani yes yes sakalendriti manti pasyanti panti kalyanti Uh Take. No, departi avers You take one candle, and you light another candle with that candle, and you light another candle with that candle. So all the different incarnations of Krishna are coming from Krishna. They have the same power as Krishna, although they don't exhibit it. But the the, the original candle was Krishna. So Krishna and his manifestations of this, his incarnations are non different than him. Govardhan is one of his expansions. Yeah, he's Krishna. Not different than Krishna. If you think it's a rock, then <laughs> you'll get a. You won't be able to understand anything. Yes. No, no, Mataji here. Yeah, yeah. You're next. Yeah, it's a holy place. Is there any difference? I mean, in this, um, how to say, uh, purification potency, or how to understand this? I mean, is it better to go to the to Vrindavan, or we can get the same with purification? It depends. It depends on the intensity of your bhakti. Because these in, these holy places are invested with so much of Krishna's mercy and shakti, you make fast advancement. But here, you can also make the same advancement, except you have to work a lot harder. <laughs> there you can float on the energy. It's, it's, it's handed to you. So, it's just like, you know... Let me see if I can find an example. You can do a job... You say you want to build a house and all you have is a hammer and some nails and a few screws. But you try to build your house and then it may take you some time and a lot of labor. But if you have all the machines and you have a whole bunch of associates to help you, how fast will that house come up? A lot different and a lot better probably. So... Extra mercy is there. The mercy is stronger there. So therefore we go to get that extra mercy. As soon as we enter into that place, immediately we get mercy. Automatically by by your entering into that. Just like when you enter into this temple, how different it is from the outside world to here. So how different this is from the you know these holy places where Krishna performed his actual leelas. And Krishna performs these leelas in this place, and these leelas are still going on, but they're in unmanifested form. 
if you have spiritual vision or you develop pure spiritual vision, you can see these same pastimes going on now. They're still happening now. That's why it says that in certain places of Vrindavan you don't go there because you're just not qualified. <laughs> place called, what is it, Seva Kunj. They don't allow anybody to stay there at night because it says that people who go there at night, they never see them again. <laughs> That's the end. They just disappear from the earth. Huh? Huh? Not that, no, it's not like that. <laughs> because they were, they're not allowed to be there. <laughs> Seva Kunj is a very special, it's one of the highest, it's, it's where Krishna danced and Rasa danced. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. So there's potency. I have a book, it's called uh, what is it called? Dham Amrita. And it describes the, the glories of holy places. It's a little paperback book. That was written about 20 years ago. And in there, it's all statements, mostly by ISKCON devotees, and also from other Shastras about the glories of the holy Dhams, like that. I don't think that book is available in circulation, but you know what? I have about 30 copies of the book. <laughs> and next time I come, I'll bring them. And then we'll make it available for devotees. I'm thinking what to do with those 30 copies. I'm <laughs> sitting. You have a copy, right? You've read it? Any comments you could say on it? Okay, so we're, yeah, so, yeah, there's, the more you hear about the glories of the holy places, the more you get attracted to them. So next time I come, which is during your kirtan mail, I think it's at the end of May, I'll, uh, somebody can remind me to bring the books. I think I have more than 30 copies, actually. Two, two very nice devotees from Germany put together that book many, many years ago. Okay, anything else, Sri Devi? Take Prashad. <laughs> <laughs> No problem. They have no problem with that one. <laughs> if you tell them to chant, you might have to work on that one a little. But still, we try. <laughs> and Prabhupada says, you know, the holy name is our weapon and the prasadam is a secret weapon. <laughs> and Prabhupada wanted prasadam distribution. He said, every temple should distribute prasadam within a range of 50 miles. He said, by prasadam distribution we can conquer the whole world just like if you go to Australia devotees are doing big big prasadam distribution programs there and people know the devotees simply by the nice food the devotees have become so popular in Australia just by prasadam distribution so yeah prasadam is you can't can't beat it <laughs> It's a treat every time you eat. It's always sweet. Can't be beat. <laughs> Prashad. <laughs> okay, anything else? Any of those new Janaki Nath? Yeah.
the Hare Krishna temple and keeping the feast. Yeah. Yeah, he's the one that he's the one that created Apple Apple computers. Yeah, see, so see, by eating prasad, you become intelligent. <laughs> More intelligent. <laughs> and the contrary is, don't eat other foods because you become. You know, I wanted to ask it. Not intelligent, but something else. The mind becomes affected in a negative way by eating foods cooked by persons who are not devotees. You get their karma. You get their energy because they put something in their in their that energy in their consciousness goes into their food, and you and then it affects your consciousness. So therefore, devotees should strictly follow that. Principle, only eat food offered to the Lord or to the spiritual master. And you'll always be... Right, Sri Devi? You wrote me about your plane trips, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. Even people... I, I do a lot of traveling on planes and the stewardess said... What would you like to eat? And I say, I brought my own. <laughs> Please give me a glass of water. That's all you want on an international flight? Thank you very much. <laughs> they can't, they, they see us. And, you know, some of us, know, they know us after a while, so they don't really push it. But some of them are so surprised we're not eating any of the food there. Because, you know, Prabhupada said, he really wrote about it, don't eat food on planes. Mm -hmm. It's mentioned in one of his books. You pick up that consciousness. And, yeah, there was one one of our spiritual masters in one in his and in the movement. One of his disciples was cooking for him, and then after a while, he kept hearing Beatles songs in his mind. <laughs> so he said to his disciple, who "Was cooking for him." Are you listening to the Beatles? And she said, how did you know? <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm eating your cooking, so I'm hearing Beatles songs. <laughs> so yeah, and especially grains. Grains, get tra they transmit the most amount of, of energy from the person like that. Particularly grains. If someone makes you a salad, there's no problem. If someone makes you a fruit dish, no problem. But if they cook something, then that's different. Like that. Yes? What are the different ways when we can uh, get other, other people's karma? For example, you mentioned when uh, somebody cooks in every day. Uh, what are the other ways? Uh, wearing somebody's shoes. If you if you wear someone's shoes, you can also pick up their karma through the feet like that. Sleeping in someone else's bed, that's also because they leave their energy in the bed also. That's why when I go to hotels, I simply sleep on the floor. <laughs> yeah, shoes, bed, and food like that. Yes. What about clothes? Not so much. But, you know, as long as the clothes are clean, yeah. That's not, not so much clothes. They don't really transmit. Bed, f shoes, and food, mostly. That's why it says that, you know, for the spiritual master, no, no one should wear his shoes, sleep in his bed, or, you know, like that. That's that's written. So yeah. Okay, I think we're moving along here in time. Yes, Shasha number two. Yeah, Shasha one here, Tim two. Do we know there's a third one there? Okay, Shasha three. Any Shasha four? <laughs> hmm.
<laughs> you have to read the Puranas to find out. <laughs> it's not mentioned in the in the text we have. The Puranas fill in the details of where Bhagavatam just fills in the essence. Mm -hmm. Like that. Mm -hmm. The persons who killed the, the children that were killed by Putana were demons. Mm -hmm. Gotta watch out how you associate with us. <laughs> okay, I think everyone is getting a, the urge for prashad. So I think, there, is there something, some prashad for everyone? Or No, you just had a feast, that's right. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. And uh, all glories to Nectar of Instructions. All glories to Srila Rupa Goswami. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna.